I, wa I want to spend a minute on this first one because this was the most uh, frequently encountered mistake that companies made. When we examined companies that failed, uh, companies said, I'm going to go to a new market, uh, um, and it doesn't work out. And, you, and then you peel it away, well, why didn't it work out? And to my mind, the most common reason it didn't work out was because of the country selection process. Uh, there's, there's, uh, an intrinsic, there's an intrinsic problem that's uh, embedded in this previous point uh, to improve scale. There's a, th this is, I think, a, you know, it's, a, it's certainly a good goal if you're selling you want to sell more. There's a problem that's embedded here that surfaces when we get to country selection. And the problem is that to improve scale is a worldview that is upside oriented. And to say what I'm trying to do is attain more, right? That's the goal of business is I'm trying to hit better numbers. The problem with that is it doesn't take into consideration downside. And when we look at where companies go wrong, it's they're wrong because they're heavily upside oriented and they don't balance that with downside concerns as well. And this is, this is what I mean on some of these points. For example, the second point there. Yeah, it's great to have high goals, but you can't let your goals get ahead of your capabilities. That feeds into point one uh, that, you know, if, you, if you're trying to think where your capabilities are going to tend to come into play the best, it's going to be in proximate markets and like markets. So you have to have other considerations, not just simply the size of the market. Right? Um, also, global channels, and I want to put in a plug here. How many, how many people here are actively in business today, in a, in a P&L company today? Maybe doing things. How, how many people here are involved in e-commerce? A few, a few I'll, I'll, just talk, I'll just touch on that, talk on the global channels. Elements. But here's the general point. We're looking at upside, upside on, on the bottom axis here, but this is downside here. So my point is, when you talk to a lot of businesses, what are you trying to do internationally? Where are you trying to go? The discussion is frequently only oriented toward upside. Well, if I'm trying to sell more, this is all I care about is the value of the market. So that's how I should target my company. But I'm saying, yeah, that's not a bad way of looking at things. But by the way, you also have to look at the downside or the cost. And then, by the way, you'll end up with some kind of array such as this. You'll say, look, if my goal is to finally hit this massive market here, but it's a more complicated market, I might want to start with a more modest market uh, and then build as my capabilities grow and then eventually end up. And, and the lesson here is the way Chinese manufacturers think about the United States or the way United States manufacturers think about China. We'd say, look, those are great markets, so you certainly want to be in those markets at some point, but you don't want to try when you don't have the capabilities. So you probably want to start in a market that uh, you're comfortable with, that you can master reasonably easily. So for, for Americans, I would say there are basically three Asian markets you need to think about, the three that have the lowest degree of difficulty, and that's Hong Kong, Singapore, and that well-known country of e-commerce. Why well, I asked about e-commerce? Because I say e-commerce offers you a channel and a, and a degree of difficulty that's pretty low, and it's a, it's a principle that holds regardless of the country. But if you can get into a market through e-commerce, e uh, you don't have to deal with a lot of other ancillary issues. I can tell you my advice from when I was in the Commerce Department, and I maintain this advice today, is, uh, so this is to the U.S. companies going abroad, is your brand and what your brand says about the product is arguably the most important, the most valuable part of your company. And uh, maintain the integrity of that brand. Do not, do not undertake a strategy which involves brand dilution uh, for the sake of more market share and more customers. Be very careful of that because you'll end up damaging the brand. And indeed, if you look at what, to my mind, the very successful U.S. companies are doing in China, Starbucks, McDonald's, Nike, Levi's, they're saying, uh, yeah, absolutely. Our brand is our key, uh, most valuable element, and a cup of Starbucks coffee in China is precisely the same as a cup of Starbucks coffee in New York City, and a McDonald's hamburger in China is precisely the same as McDonald's hamburger here in terms of the quality and the ingredients and so forth. So there's no, there's no down market or developing market Starbucks, and let's go for more sales by reducing the price point and making it a less. They're saying there's one Starbucks experience globally, like one Nike experience globally, and all we would do is hurt ourselves if we came up with an alternative uh, to that we would do by destroying the brand. Uh, so it would be self-defeating. So I, uh, that would be one core recommendation I'd 
offer people in the consumer market space. You'll, you'll give up some element of uh, penetration in the market because you've got basically a premium price product, but you do maintain your brand integrity, which over time I think is where you want to be. Yeah, let me offer a general comment on IP, on intellectual property. And it's, it can be vexing, and every market has a different regime, a different degree of, of integrity to its IP system. But I think there's a universal truth that I can share, which is the best defense is a good offense. If you're concerned about uh, knockoffs and ripoffs and pirates and gray market, uh, which are all valid concerns, you need to make sure you're being as aggressive as you can distributing the authentic product in that market. And it sounds almost self-evident, but it's surprising the number of people I hear you say, I don't really want to go into this market because there's a pirated activity going on there. You say, look, it should be just the opposite. Because as consumer education grows and as consumer affluence grows, what's going to happen? That preference for authenticity, right? You're less, you're less price sensitive, but you are increasingly quality sensitive. So as we say on the trading floor, the trend is your friend you're going to get some share of the market being the authentic product and that share is going to grow. But it also gives you the ability to start whittling away at the pirates through legal action or advertising or shutting down their distribution chains and taking some of the joy out of their life. Uh, so I would say rule number one is if you're concerned about piracy is you've got to get in the game. Uh, the long-term trend is one of improvement, but it's still, it's still a problem in many uh, markets. But back to e-commerce, for example, uh, what you'll find is the major platform operators in China will be very sensitive to complaints. If you show up and say, I am the official manufacturer of this product, and there's some fellow on your site who claims that they're selling the, but they're not, I mean, you can get that taken off the site. So you, it's a little bit of a whack-a-mole game you're playing, but you can pursue that. Uh, your other question had to do with, oh, finding a partner? Uh, I'll give another rule of thumb, which is, um, Life is a job interview. What you want to do is set up a end sum game of end sum iteration. So it's open ended relationship, and the other party has an ongoing structural incentive to perform. Right? And so if you're in that kind of relationship where there's a strong convergence of views and the other party is properly incentivized, this relationship ought to go on uh, forever. I think where Americans or others get in trouble in new markets is the other fellow looks at a payoff matrix that says, you know what, whether I cooperate with you or whether I don't cooperate with you, I'm just as good either way, so what's the point of cooperating with you? So you've got to be able to, to have that payoff matrix work the right way. And that also one of the points on the slides was move incrementally, right? I mean, you, you, you're, you're being interviewed, you're going through your job interview, and he's going through his job interview as well. And so you're you're testing each time, you're starting small, and you're seeing how people perform. So, I mean, the, the, the underlying point is this, your legal recourse might be very limited in many of these markets. And if you have to build a relationship that's you know, premised on legal protection, I think you're making a mistake. So what you have to do is come up with a relationship where there's an alignment of interests and everybody's properly incentivized to perform. I would say, as a starting point, every company ought to do three things. It ought to understand U.S. law, FCPA, and when does it apply, when does it not apply, and there's, there's some areas it doesn't apply, but you need to understand when would the U.S. government consider this a normal gift and when would it not consider it a gift. So you need to understand U.S. parameters. Two, you need to understand host country parameters. And you can say, well, these laws are widely not observed, but you better understand what they are, and that is not a defense, either inside your company or inside local law, and to say, they're not observed. I would say if that's the rationale that somebody's saying, I, I do not want to go any further in this discussion. Right? So I want to understand what host, company, host country law tells me to do and what U.S. law tells me to do. Three, we as a company need to have a written policy, and our people need to be trained on this policy. So we need to say ourselves, gift giving is permissible in these circumstances. And here's an example, you know, for a birthday or Christmas or whatever, you know, whatever, but it must be under $100, it must be this, it must be approved by your supervisor, it cannot be a cash gift, whatever the parameters are. But you need to stipulate that yourselves. It needs to be written and people need to be formally trained. This is what we're allowed to do. And this is enormously helpful to your people in the field because no matter what happens, at some point somebody's going to get tapped. 
to say, I can make this happen, I can get you the contract, I can do it, but I need a little help. And you, your guys need to be protected and be able to say, you know what, my friend, I'm not allowed to do it. I'm not allowed to do it. I can take you to lunch, and that's about it. I can take you to a movie, too. But I mean, that's it. That's all, that's all we can do. That's all the fun we can have. And that's it. Right? And, you know, that can cause friction and unhappiness and all sorts of things, but it protects that, protects your people in the field. I think the U.S. businesses are way ahead of the game because of FCPA. But you will hear from American businesses, you know, I could have won this if I was allowed to facilitate, but you guys won't let me. And to say, well, who knows? Who knows that? I, you know, in a way, even if it's true, you're looking at the numerator of the fraction. You're not looking at the denominator. You're saying, I could have won this. And my response is, yeah, but how many would you facilitate that you wouldn't have won anything? And then you're setting up a pattern where you're the piggy bank and you're feeding into a bad system and you're contributing to it and you're setting yourself up for legal issues and you're going down a path I don't think you want to go down. So you're better off not going down that path. Uh, but those, those are the three core bits of advice I tell any company.